Oh, somebody would have to stand over there and do that. <laughs> 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 yeah. So Revelation chapter 14 tonight. And uh, the beast, remember last week, well, not all of you were here. I know. <laughs> so we, we looked in chapter 13 really is an introduction to the Antichrist. The beast that rises up out of the sea. The dragon gives the beast all of his power. The dragon we know from Revelation 13 um, that, that the dragon is Satan. Um, and so it it's very, becomes very clear. Actually, that was in 12. That where, uh, 12 verse 9. It describes the great dragon as Satan himself. The old serpent. The devil and Satan. So, uh, but that was last week in chapter 13, seeing Antichrist kind of on the rise, and that that we also talked about this uh, false trinity that can be seen where Satan is kind of all the power seems to be coming from him, and then this Antichrist, he seems to actually uh, maybe even uh, possess his body. And uh, he even has this false or counterfeit uh, resurrection from the dead, just as Jesus has been raised from the dead. And then the false prophet that comes onto the scene that we that Satan would like us to think is the Holy Spirit. So you kind of have this false trinity that Satan is is trying to deceive the world, um, and he will be successful, seemingly for seven and a half years. And then it all comes <laughs> just hammered, hammering down. But um, that's kind of where we left off. And then talking about the, uh, the image of the beast, the, the mark of the beast as it's been called. Um, and note too that the mark was not on your hand or on your forehead, but it was in. Which is again a pretty heavy... The, the Greek, actually, the phrase is in and not on. And it's pretty uh, prophetic in the fact that we're talking about microchips that can be implanted, embedded in the skin or in the hand or in wherever you're talking about. Um, and so, again, we can get caught up on not only the mark of the beast, but even the Antichrist um, and the number, 666. There were many people that thought Ronald Reagan, because of his name, and all three of his names, his middle name, I don't know what it is, but they all have six letters in it. So, Michael? So, they all thought that he was the Antichrist, and they you could see how you could run with this and come to no conclusion or come to empty conclusions. And the exciting thing about the book of Revelation is it does come with its own divine outline. And we know from just the very beginning of the book, um, in Revelation 1.19, these are the things that will be hereafter, that are coming. Um, and we know that we will be caught up. Ever since chapter 4 of Revelation, the church is no longer there. The church is no longer addressed by Jesus Christ. In fact, even we saw that how he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. He mentioned that in, uh, in chapter uh, 13 and verse 9. But what's missing from verse 9 of chapter 13 is to the churches. And so it's interesting that he left that out. If the church is supposed to be here during the time that Antichrist is is rising and the mark of the beast is going to be uh, in play, I think you would put that in there. And, and it's important as we go through, I think I mentioned this when we started the book of Revelation, to always be sensitive to that, the difference of the church and these what we'll call tribulation saints. Those saints that will come out of the tribulation that will endure. We're actually going to look right here at chapter 14. Um, at, at just this incredible group that we've already been introduced to, 
but and you guys right away will be reminded of it. In verse 1 of Revelation 14, it says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts, or living creatures, and the elders. And no man could learn that song except the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, remember? <laughs> For they are virgins. And these are they which follow the Lamb. It's an important key. It jumped out at me. That's why I titled the message that. <laughs> these are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever He goes. These were redeemed from among men being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile or deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Imagine that being said of you or of me, to be without fault before the throne of God Himself, standing there without fault. And we know these guys have been set aside. They're all Jews, thus 144,000. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. These guys are those that we're, we spoke about, we were introduced to before, and they're going to be like 144,000 Billy Grahams, just going throughout the world declaring the Gospel, declaring that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that Israel has been waiting for. Um, and the biggest thing is these guys are pure. These guys are set apart for the Lord in such a way that they seem to be virgins and they seem to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Who's the Lamb? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. And so this is so important for us to understand if you want to be pure, if you want to make it to heaven, what do you have to do? Follow the Lamb. And that's it. I love it. following Jesus. Being all about Jesus. Understanding it really is all about Jesus. All these other things may come up in your life, but make sure that you are sure that the most important thing in your life, the most important part of your life is Jesus Christ. It's true of everyone, by the way. It's not just you. It's, in the end, what did you do with Jesus? How do you respond to the call of Jesus? And these 144,000, it pays off that they have been pure. They have been completely sold out to the Lord set apart for Him to use. Now, they have gone through what we just read about. <laughs> they have been going through these incredible times of disaster. And we're going to see it only gets worse. Where men are begging to die but won't be able to. These times that will come on the earth, it's known as the uh, time of Jacob's trouble or the Great Tribulation. This, the seven years of tribulation that will begin kind of as soon as we are snatched out, raptured up. And so these guys will be those who are on the earth at that time. And this is incredible because it's almost as if there's a second rapture here. And it's involving these guys, these 144,000, because they've endured, they've been there. And it's interesting, earlier in chapter 4, we see, I think it's, maybe it's chapter 5. Let me check myself. I think it's actually chapter 5. The church sings a new song. 
You guys remember that? What yes. That? Uh, Revelation 5, verse 9. Um, in Revelation 5, 9, they sang a new song. And this is the song that we sing as the church in heaven. Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and have redeemed us to God by the blood. Remember that? This 144,000 are not singing the same new song that we sang. It's still redemption, only they, as we just read in verse uh, chapter 14, verse 3, they were redeemed from the earth, and the earth was in total disaster at this time. So it's, it's as if, uh, don't get me wrong, it's still the blood of the Lamb that redeems any of us, but these guys realize you've taken us out and you've kept us from, not just kept us from, but kept us through that incredible tribulation. And Jesus does the same thing today. Only it's not going to be the great tribulation like this. But He is with you through the tribulation. Always and forever. That's what's so powerful about this. They remain pure. They remain set apart to God. For God to use. They're not concerned with what people think about them. Because especially for Jews, you're not going to get married. You're not going to be with a woman. <laughs> you're not going to, you know, it's, it's wild. <laughs> I mean, we, we take family kind of serious here in, in America. But Israel, you are shunned. <laughs> it's unheard of. That's your whole meaning in life is to <laughs> get married and have children. And they are all about it. If you wonder how big they are into it, watch Fiddler on the Roof sometime. And you get a, a glimpse, you get a little bit of just how important this whole thing of, of raising a family. Well, these guys will be called by God not to do so. And they will stand firm in that. And it will be incredible tribulation that none of us can imagine. But we do have a picture in... Two pictures, actually, in the Old Testament, I think, that point to these 144,000 that will be kept, though there is a storm, a flood, rising, and only getting worse, bringing judgment on any who have totally forsaken God and won't turn to God. The first is Noah. Noah's ark. Noah and his family were in that ark during that time of great tribulation on the whole earth where flood, the waters, were taking out everyone on the earth. Do not think that Noah on the ark represents the church. It doesn't. It's not a good picture. Why? Because the church will not be in the tribulation, the time of the tribulation. Enoch, as we've many times, I've referenced is a picture of you and I the church who was taken up before Noah even started building that boat <laughs> he was taken out before that time of the flood that's not true Noah spent a lot of years building that boat so I think Enoch was taken we know he was taken for sure before the flood and so it's a picture there but I think a, a powerful picture especially for this Incredible tribulation is in Daniel chapter 3. And you guys should know this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Mm -hmm. They're told to bow the knee. And we talked a little bit about Nebuchadnezzar and his uh, power trip, his ego trip that he was on, and how the beast, the Antichrist, will be a lot like that and even come out with an image that people will bow down to. Well, Nebuchadnezzar, already in Daniel chapter 3, picturing this whole thing, said, bow down or you'll die. Take the mark or you will die. <laughs> and bow to the image. Pledge allegiance to this image or you will die. And three of them didn't. And they were put into that furnace, right? But God kept them. Though they were in 
the tribulation. God kept them. He preserved them. He, his, he's faithful to do so. So it's a great picture there of, of uh, these 144,000 that will be kept during that incredible time, fiery time of tribulation. And the, the funnest question to ask as you study Daniel chapter 3 is where's Daniel? Because Daniel could represent the church. He's not in the text. He's not in the little story there. In fact, um, it's, it's, there's a lot of interesting little subtleties I won't get into, but it's, it's fascinating how the Holy Spirit will, the omissions, I always find it amazing. Where's Daniel? <laughs> well, just like the church, we won't be here during that time of great tribulation. He's out of the picture. <laughs> and so, cool stuff to see. Pictures and illustrations with the Old Testament. Always like that. So you have Noah's Ark. There's probably others that I'm missing. But Noah's Ark and Daniel, Daniel's three friends uh, in Daniel chapter 3. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So, these guys, though, the other thing to note is not just that they, they were uh, virgins, not that just that they had been set apart. The 144,000, verse 5, in their mouth was found no guile, no deceit. There was not, no perversion, no wickedness was found in their mouth. And it's important what comes out of our mouth. <laughs> On a practical note, your words, you will stand before the throne of God and you will be accountable for the things you spoke. Scary thought, but it's a true thought. Jesus said you will be justified by the words that you say or condemned by the words that you say. So the words that we speak are a big, big deal. It doesn't matter. James chapter 3 can back me up. <laughs> if you think your words don't mean that much, then you have to look at a forest fire and say, ah, it's nothing. <laughs> no, it causes serious damage. So the words that we speak, and I'll add to that, the words that we type into our phone or on the screens or... No, no. <laughs> <laughs> the words, the words that, you, out there. that you dwell on, don't let it become words of deceit, of guile of, of just wickedness um, and of course I have to throw in we will be in the presence of the Lord and found without fault why the blood of the Lamb again same way that these people are redeemed we are redeemed and we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and it's only because Jesus Christ had died on that cross and now, if you will, God sees us in Christ. It's a, it's a mystery. Nobody can totally comprehend that. But He sees you, He sees me, righteous because of Christ. Not because of my works. <laughs> Praise God, hallelujah. <laughs> it's not because of my efforts or my cleaning up. It's all a work of... of <laughs> Well, it's all the blood of Jesus Christ. It's all, again, the work of the cross and the gospel. And this is powerful because here in verse 6, the reason I stop there is God always has a way of getting His Word out. And it's incredible to me, even through this time of tribulation, Chapter 6 through 19, as we're in the midst of that here, terrible, terrible time on the planet. He just got done sending two witnesses, two prophets, probably Moses and Elijah, as we've mentioned, who declare the testimony of Jesus Christ. They spread the good news, just like here these 144,000 have been. Declaring the gospel. Now look in verse 6. Now that the 144,000 are up in heaven with us. Verse 6. It doesn't stop. And I saw. Verse 6. 
another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. That's incredible. And to every nation, to every kindred and tongue and people. Verse 7, here's what he's saying with a loud voice. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. It's in, it really is incredible how pure. Notice, because this is future. This is all going to happen. We will be taken out. The 144,000 will be here preaching. They will be taken up. And here this angel will be sent of God. And notice the message doesn't change. It's still what he refers to, and I love that phrase, the everlasting gospel. It, it's, it's incredible, verse 6, right? That's what this angel that's been dispatched by God is sent to preach, the everlasting gospel, the same gospel that we preach, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth. Even that very simple phrase has been under attack, right? Did God really create the earth? I don't know, it's, it's been billion, 4.6 trillion. It's been a long time. Well, this angel will show up and he's going to declare to people, if you're tired of the tribulation, if you're tired of the hail the size of grapefruits, mm -hmm. if you're tired of the just the endless agony that these people will be under, worship him. Worship him. Fear God. And no longer fear the Antichrist, the, well, Satan, ultimately. And there followed now another angel, verse 8, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. <laughs> that great city, because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel then followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be uh, tormented with fire and brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Different picture here of Jesus Christ than, than uh, you know, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John portray Him to be. Here He is really, <laughs> vengeance, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. This is where that vengeance is. They are going to be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Verse 11, And the, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. <laughs> and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and who, whosoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. And I heard a voice from heaven say unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. From henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. So, again, a heavy hitting section here of Jesus being that warrior. Not necessarily, and it's interesting that he's referred to as the Lamb, but really he's victorious. The Lamb will be victorious, ultimately. Mm -hmm. The only one worthy. But you, you wonder about those that will take the mark, those that do 
bow before Antichrist and follow uh, in His image, take on him, His image and receive His mark, there you have it. That's what will happen to them. Torment forever, day and night. I mean, no messing around. And so, it's, it, that's why we want to get the word out. Don't take the mark. When we're all gone, when we're raptured up, don't take the mark. There's still this very, very, very slim window. And I don't even know about that with what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says about the strong delusion. In 2 Thessalonians 2, God will send a strong delusion where those who would want to know God can't. It's too late. So there's this strong delusion. And 2 Thessalonians 2 is a great uh, companion, if you will, to this little section of Antichrist uh, on the rise and what, what we're reading about here. But another one, uh, well, let's finish out the chapter. <laughs> Otherwise I won't. Uh, verse 14 here. 14. Revelation 14, 14. And I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sick sickle, and reap, reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. That is a plea um, that this angel is making to Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. Uh, we have to remember angels never command Jesus Christ to do anything. And so I, I have that in my notes and I think it's important that we don't read 15 as if the angel's commanding Jesus to thrust that sickle and reap. <laughs> Though the, this angel most likely has been waiting for a long time for this to happen. And so he's, he's pleading. It's his final cry here. Jesus, thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for thee to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Verse 16, And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle, sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, and he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, and cried with a loud voice to, to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the cluster of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. There's an interesting phrase you might want to dig into, and you could do some research on. What is the great winepress of the wrath of God? Well, verse 20 helps a little bit. And the wine, pre wine press was trodden without the city or outside the city, and blood came out of the wine press even unto the horse's bridle by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. So you're talking. 200 miles. <laughs> I did the math. Yeah. I don't know when I read it. 200 miles. Incredible. This is bloodshed. This is what we refer to as the, the Battle of Armageddon where all of the nations of the earth are going to come up. Psalm chapter 2 is another one to jot down next to this little section. Because Psalm chapter 2 says, and I love Psalm 2 because it's a short one, and maybe I'll just shut up and read it. Because the, you guys know the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. Yes, so... I love Psalm 2, the whole thing. Why do the nations rage, and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth, or the leaders of the earth, set themselves up, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, and against His anointed. So, it's a, it's a reference there to Jerusalem, Israel, 
and ultimately Messiah, which will rule and reign from that. But that's, that's, this is all of the nations banding together ultimately to go up against Jesus Christ, the, His anointed. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And he that sits in the heavens, verse 4 of Psalm 2, shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. <laughs> then shall he speak unto them his wrath, in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Which, interestingly enough, that was at the beginning of Revelation uh, chapter 14. This holy hill of Zion is a reference to Jerusalem. I will decree, uh, declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day I have, have I begotten thee. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen, the nations for your inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. And somebody did a little comparison when I was listening. I think it was Chuck Smith talking about this sickle being that rod of iron. The sickle that we just read about with the angels, you know. But he's going to rule and reign with a rod of iron. Whether it's that sickle or... It will happen. So you're going to break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, instructed you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and ye perish from the way when His wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. What's happening in chapter 14 of Revelation is a people, a nation, a whole group putting their trust in Babylon, in man. Remember what 666 represents? It's man. That's the number of man. And really, if you want to go down in history as someone who identifies and pledge, pledges all that they are to the work, the day, the power of man. And many will. That's what's crazy. They do today. We can see people that get real smart. They study hard. And man, they're brilliant. They invent these incredible new ways of doing things. And, man, and, and they can take over the, the whole earth. <laughs> and they will. Yes. We are living in the day of man. But the day of the Lord is coming. Very soon. The day of the Lord is upon us. But it's incredible. We can, we can forget that you know, that mark, really, to me, the fact that six is the number of man, all you have to do is just remain in the, under the, the authority of mankind, government, the rule and reign of, of man, any kind of kingship. And that it will, ultimately, Psalm chapter 2, it will end up going against all that is God, all that... <laughs> Well, Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. And so what we read about is people. <laughs> it's pictured as grapes being put into a wine press. Those will be people. They're not going to be grapes. How do I know? Because it's going to be blood that will fill up 200 miles worth up to the horse's I mean, you're talking, this is a blood, bloody, bloody scene. And we get upset when people cut us off. <laughs> We're tempted to take someone to court. Are you kidding me? So much greater, so much more is this that we read. Jesus Christ will repay. I used to love this old teacher that, that we had. That he just had a very simple way to put this. Payday one day. It's coming. There will be payday. We look around and it's hard. We get lost. We're like David, the psalmist, who, who said, 
the wicked prosper. And he said, David said, my foot slipped because I started to look at this rich guy that was getting away with just crooked perversion and he's succeeding. He's popular. He's, it's, I mean, that's my translation. That's what he, I'm slipping here, Lord. I'm backsliding as the, I'm no, I'm no longer looking at Christ. I've got my eyes on this prosperous, wicked fella. We can find ourselves doing the same thing. Forgetting, that's what the, the blessing, I think, one of the many blessings of Re- Revelation, is that we know that this is coming. If you believe that Jesus came and was born in Bethlehem, you have twice, if not three or four times as much proof to believe this, what we just read. Why? Because much more of the Old Testament prophecies are concerning this. This battle of Armageddon, this day of the Lord as Joel talks about, Ezekiel chapter 38, 39, all of these things are alluded to. And God takes it very seriously, doesn't He? (laughs) It's not an allegory. I read stuff like this in Revelation and I scratch my head at, at the false teachers, I'll call them that, that would dare to say that these events have already taken place. Mm-hmm. How in the world do you get away with Well, the way that they get around that is it's all a picture. It's, all, it's not going to be literally blood up to the horse's bridle. It's, it's some kind of allegory. And somehow they explain this stuff away. But it's a dangerous ground because we take the Bible seriously, don't we? And we understand God says what He means and He means what He says. He never messes around with that. But to the very last end, God is continuing to send the Word. He's continued to... The angels come. Even the the second angel that comes, Babylon has fallen. Don't look to commercial Babylon because we're going to get into the Babylons later on. Uh, I think it's chapter 17 or 16, but later in Revelation, we, got, we talk about these Babylons, whether it's advertising, commercial Babylon, which, which is just, I mean, you can look around in America and see what it looks like. <laughs> but, but there's a whole other side of it where, where it's religious Babylon. And there will be, just like there is today, oh, I, I have my religion. And that will keep me through these times of difficulty and pain. This angel is declaring, Babylon has fallen. Your religion has fallen. Your uh, uh, commercial, (laughs) your um, trust, which again, the, the way that Psalm 2 ends, those who put their trust in the Lord and not in these other things that will come along. And it, it works, it's, it's, there's that twofold, uh, two-fold prophecy, if you will. It's practical for us today not to trust in stuff that comes along, but it's also prophesying about a day that comes where people do trust in their riches or in some great leader, whatever, whoever it may be. But this is going to be the day of the Lord, and it's going to be like we read in Romans I brought this up last time and I didn't remember what verse. So I'm going to make sure again. Romans 12, verse 19. Because anytime you read about Jesus wielding the sickle with the iron rod, just judging the nations, remember Romans 12, 19. It tells us, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather... Give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. <laughs> Romans twelve nineteen, Powerful stuff. And what it says at the end of Romans 12, in 21, Romans 12, 21, the last verse of Romans 12, Do not be overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That is what just happened. Jesus Christ is overcoming evil with good. How do you know? He's the only good there is. (laughs) 
Apart from Him, there is nothing that is good. And so it's, it, there's some powerful stuff there. A lot to chew on in, in this Revelation 14. The Son of Man with that sharp sickle, that angel again crying out, pleading, let's put this day of man to an end. We're done. <laughs> it's, yeah, we're, we're over it. There's no justice. In fact, there's just perversions of justice, totally perverted. It's totally twisted. There's no honesty. And we're going to see. Just like the old, my dad has a shirt, I think, that says, I've read, we win in the end, I've read the end, or something like that. <laughs> he wins, I've read the end. That's where we're going. That's Jesus Christ is here as our reigning champion, going up against the rulers, all of them. And the place that Armageddon, I wasn't going to get into that, but the place that Armageddon is, Megiddo, the Valley of Megiddo, is actually a intersection of all of the, the different world dominators. <laughs> I mean, people that have ruled the known world at, in times past, you know, that, that will come across and they intersect right there. And it's the perfect place for this battle where all the nations of the world will, will one day all come together and go up against Almighty God. It's right. It's hard to believe, but we see that it's all in play. We see things are falling into place. Everything from why do we still have money, paper money that we're using? What are we living in 1983 or something? Second time I came up with it. Okay. <laughs> Why, why we need to get rid of this? Why, why are there all these different governments? Can't we all just be a one world government? You can see that it's coming. You can see the unity, that, that the utopia that people long for and believe can exist with the right political leader, with the right person in there, whatever it is. It's being set up. And so I'm reminded... Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, for He will direct your path. Because again, you read these big, long-winded chapters that so much is happening with somebody sitting on a cloud and he's got a golden crown on and this sickle in his hand and this, that, or the other. And really, the, with the Holy Spirit, at least for me, just brings it back down to practical practical things in my day-to-day -day life. Mm. I better not ever trust in what we call the almighty dollar. I better not ever trust in any kind of advice, if you will, or counsel that is from the flesh. It's just from, from wickedness. Now, God uses us in each other's lives. And so I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, and I'm not against Christian counseling and all of that stuff that happens, but where do we go to first? That's, that's the thing. Where do we go to first? Who do we call out to first? It better be Jesus. It better be the living God. Because <laughs> he, He's got the answers for everything. And so, and we will praise Him forever. That's another reason I did that None But You song. It reminded me of what these 144,000 are doing. They come up into heaven and they're praising the Lord with a new song. Everybody's harping on a harp. And they're just singing out. And if you don't know how to play a harp or a guitar, don't worry, you will. <laughs> You'll be the best harpist there is with the best voice there is. And so exciting. <laughs> it is. Just, we will praise the Lord forever in His presence, in the presence of the Lamb. Now, following the Lamb 
is taking up your cross daily. Denying yourself the very things that you would do or want or desire, crave or lust. And following the Lamb is something we do not just once, right? But it's a daily thing. That's Jesus. Daily pick up your cross. Daily deny yourself. Daily follow me. And it is incredible how that He is with you and never leaves you, never forsakes you, never turns His back to you, especially during those times of tribulation, of fire. In fact, when does the fourth man show up? Not until Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get in in Daniel chapter 3. Step into that furnace of fire. Then Jesus shows up. There's a fourth man in there, Nebuchadnezzar said. One looks like the Son of Man. It was Jesus there in the fire with them. Same thing again for you and I when when we're going through these things, difficulties, trials, tribulations. Because Jesus said in this world, you will have great times. No, He didn't say that. In this world, you will have tribulations. And so, it's going to come. Amen. Used to, used to have a teacher that used to say, if you haven't had hard times or tribulations, cheer up, you will. <laughs> they come along for each of us. And Peace through it all. Count it worthy, yeah. <laughs> count it all joy, as James says, mm-hmm. when you fall into these various t- t- trials, testings, they're all going to come. But He's there. That's what's so cool. The Lamb is there. Even in in, uh, Revelation 14. They are standing next to the Lamb. I think it's just, it's so encouraging. Father, we thank You how faithful You are. How Your Word is so comforting even in these heavy chapters where there's a lot going on, Lord. We can take, we just have such hope. A living hope. And we know, Lord, You're coming. You're coming soon. And we look to You as we just worship You. We join in with creation now. We join in with the angels and just sing songs of praise of thanksgiving to You. Let's sing. As Ronald Wilson.